All right, we've got an exciting program today with the introduction. Uh, we've got Reverend Jerry Haygard. Thank you, President David. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Carter Kena, who is an architect here in Pensacola. Uh, he's been a principal of his firm since 1984. Since graduation from Auburn University in 78, Carter has... <laughs> he's brought his education through internships in Birmingham and New York. I'm getting a little closer to Tuscaloosa, I see. Uh, Carter has been very active in historic preservation. Quite, quite honestly, uh, there's been a lot of talk here lately about heritage tourism, but before there can be heritage tourism, there has to be history, and there has to be both preservation and interpretation of that history. And architecture plays a very significant role in that, and Carter has devoted a lot of his practice to historic <laughs> preservation, not only here, but around the country. He's been involved as a 10-year board member with West Florida Historic Preservation, excuse me, a 12-year board member, and he was 10 years serving with the Old Florida <laughs> Historic Preservation Advisory Council, which is now the uh, historic uh, Florida Historical Commission. You see both the Secretary of State appointment and a gubernatorial appointment from uh, Jeb Bush. They're responsible for projects all over the state, and they award or distribute a little over $17 million annually for uh, historic preservation work uh, in our uh, great state. Mr. Keno opened his professional practice in 1984, and his firm, Keno Grunhofer Architects, has grown to one of the most recognized firms uh, in our area. Carter has also uh, maintained a consistent dialogue in the academic community uh, with, over concerns on, uh, regarding ongoing exploration into architecture and historic preservation. It was this interest that culminated in a master's degree in architecture from Tulane University. Can I get a green wave? <laughs> he has lectured on many occasions to students and colleagues, and his work has been featured in numerous articles and video presentations or productions. He now is an adjunct professor at the University of West Florida teaching a graduate level course in historic preservation. Please welcome Carter Keaton. Jerry, I'm sound pretty good. I had no idea you guys had so much fun here. I mean, with the music, my partner Danny would have come if he would have known there was live entertainment. Uh, thank you, Jerry, for inviting me to speak to you today. I hope I have something interesting to share to each of you because I consider most of you friends and acquaintances. I know everyone in the room almost. And that's what happens when you pick a place to live. And I picked this place to live. Now, while my father, I'm the fourth son of Richard Kena, who was the fourth son of William Richard Kena, who was the fourth child of Marion Albert Kena, who was the fourth surviving child of Dr. Desiderio Kena Jr., who lived in the old Kena house just a few blocks away from here. Uh, the Kena family, when my father was being raised, was in Mobile. There was a sort of faction that split. Because my dad liked to drink a little bit too much, and he was in the lumber business, and so his wife said, screw you, I'm moving to Mobile. <laughs> because my dad was a, uh, in the paper business, which meant I spent a lot of time in the back of a big station wagon with five children, moving all over the southeast, including Spring Hill, Louisiana, Bastrop, Louisiana, Pine Bluff, Arkansas. If there was an award for some of the 10 worst streets in America, those places probably would win those awards. Uh, I picked Pensacola for lots of reasons. I was at the time working in New York. I had, uh, quite successful in New York as an intern. It was funny, I was the Auburn graduate, and all these Cornell and Harvard and MIT and Syracuse graduates were all working with me, and they were actually working for me, because I understood how to get things done. And I carried that forth with me. As soon as I could take the test to graduate as a professional architect, I did. I was very fortunate to pass it the first time. That's not always easily said. And so I'm registered in New York and five other states now. And when my wife Charlotte and I decided where did we want to return to on the Gulf Coast, uh, Mobile was a suggestion, uh, Point Clear, Fairhope was a suggestion, 
New Orleans, when we looked east of here, and what I did when we visited the first time in Pensacola and went to North Hill, I had visited only a couple of times, of course, where did I go? Boogie Bottom. That this time I visited the historic districts, I visited the downtown. And for these reasons, it's why I picked Pensacola. And, and it's really created a career that I'm very proud of and has some success with. And I think all of y'all have been in many of my projects. They're either churches, and you're here to brag on that for me a little bit. Where do you go? Thank you. Henry's here, and, and, and many of my churches have been in historic places. Uh, historic buildings, including the Cultural Center, those projects are all the <coughs> Old Christ Church, one I'm most proud of. Uh, but two really important things, historical things, happened last weekend. And one of them was that Palafox Street was named one of the ten most important streets in America. And the other was that my daughter Natalie was married at Barclay House last weekend. And we had a wonderful place. The Barclay House, we all know it and love it very well. But it was an extremely well done restoration that we were to get for us for The project and the grounds were done at a Pensacola level. And I'll speak to that a little bit this afternoon in terms of what I mean by a Pensacola level. All of us have traveled, all of us have seen wonderful places and we come back and say, why can't we do that here? Well, then you can. We'll be doing it sort of at a Pensacola level. Now, as an architect, images are important. So I have all these slides over here that some of you will be able to pay attention to and some of you won't. And I apologize for that time. I will try to describe it. But, but this map right here shows that my firm probably had a hand in making Tower Street one of the 10 best streets. Over 22 projects that all center around Palafox Street. And of course, you can't see them in great sites, but all those red lines in the middle are the corridor that is Palafox Street. So, we're the reason that it did so well. Of course, it wasn't my money, but it was some of my ideas. Beginning with the first project uh, for Bill Lenny. He may be a member of one of the other Rotary Clubs, but I and this young interior designer named Lois Benson was in town at the time, and she and I worked together with Bill on this first restoration for me on Powell Fox Place. And if you see the interior on the right, it still looks like that today. 25, 30 years later, this project is going to become a, a historic renovation if I continue to be successful here in town. Uh, it led to the second project, which was the Pensacola Cultural Center. This was when I was just crazy enough and young enough to take on a challenge to say, hey, would you help us for free? Maybe one day we'll have enough money to actually raise to do the construction. Well, I was talked into this project many times, and the last time I think I spoke to a Rotary Club, it was about this project 20 some odd years ago. It was one of the most grassroots, roots-based projects that I've ever been involved with. I was familiar with it. Gary McCoy was a good friend of mine at the time, but he helped make this project work. I was the first president of the board of, trust, of, board of directors for the Combination of Pensacola Youth Theater, Pensacola Cultural Center group. And I followed that preservation funding group all over the state of Florida and became pretty well versed in what you needed to do to get a grant. That's why they put me on the panel, I think. John Daniels saw that that training that I, or experience, let's say that, you, you don't get trained in historic preservation. You, you learn it by doing it. Sometimes you have to be very careful what you ask for. When we were just recently hired to do the Rex Theater restoration, finally, Harvest Church. If they can continue to be successful with their fundraising, we will have the Rex Theater as, a, as an occupied place on Pelican Street. Old Christ Church, very important to everyone. The research that, that was required to figure out the right steps when we decided we wanted to paint or whitewash the red brick, you would have thought we were creating a moral sin at the time. But it was authentic. It was what we found in our research to be the true way the exterior was treated. And of course, that old brick had been sandblasted once. So the city owned it for the library. They didn't know what they were doing. They thought that was the right application. But it destroyed the weathering surface of the brick. So now the whitewash that's there is protecting it for generations to come. Old Christ Church is as busy as any venue in downtown Pensacola because we invested in and the archaeologists in the room, how many of them are there, I'm not sure. They, they wince when we describe this. We used a geothermal system. It was the first geothermal 
system installed for a commercial application in Pensacola. The cost, operational costs for this building are far less than any of the others in the village. And it's, it satisfies more wedding celebrations like Natalie's uh, than, than one of any of the other neighborhoods. And it's a great meeting hall. It's a great place to, to gather and have live music. The Sanger Theater lobby was the next project that involved. The city of Pensacola said, let's take the space next door and live it. I'm sure many of y'all remember when you had the long ramp to get up into the Sanger, and it was a very narrow and very unproductive space. But we were able to convince the city hall to let us tear that all out and create a two-story space, twice as many restrooms, a handicap accessible elevator, and it's, it's allowed Sanger to grow in today's functional needs. Uh, the Florida Trust, uh, as mentioned by Jerry, I've been on the board forever, and uh, I was involved with their headquarters building in, in Tallahassee. Uh, this is the Paisley House, which was restored, receives several awards. Uh, the old county courthouse, just a few blocks from here, also a Palafox Place, had come to Bartell Gallery. We were able to convince the county commission to apply for a grant, and then they received the grant. And then that money was then used for the restoration of the lobby. Removing the old, remember the old mezzanine, you'd walk in and the, the ceiling would be like this and the stair would be here. Well, we found wonderful details that were now uncovered. We're hoping to convince the county commission to apply for another grant so we can finish the second floor of the old commission space cha uh, chambers above that lay-in ceiling with some of that beautiful plaster detailing that is what uh, I've had a couple of county commissioners wish they could move back into the old building. The Imaging Theater, thank you Impact 100 ladies who's ever here. They finally were successful this weekend in getting their grant to put the lights that you see are missing in the uh, old wood ceiling there. This is a project that was almost burnt down about three years ago, the fire in the building just adjacent to it. And they were able to use fire insurance money plus some state grant money to restore it as Walker Willis Jr. intended. My house in North Hill was designed by Walter Willis Jr. He also designed this project, so I feel like I've walked in some of his footsteps. And I've learned quite a bit about how to fix, and that has helped me make decisions in terms of other renovation projects. That's an important thing that keeps us at a level of what's right for Pensacola. And the Governor Perry House, I know Jerry's fond of this particular project. The first restoration was when the Scottish Rite had it, and then it's now on the first night of church. Uh, this has been restored and this was an uncovering thing. We had to go through layers of old ceilings to find some of the original old wallpaper. And we had a big argument about Greek revival. And if you've ever worked for churches, you know a big argument can become pretty big about <laughs> carpet color. So I've been involved quite a bit of that in kind of discussion. And of course, Dr. Benz, I'm not sure you made it, but I wanted to honor her with the Florida Public Archaeology Network. This is a big deal. And the headquarters are just Space and their offices. Uh, they have been relocated a few blocks away from Theopolis May, who can you're in the office. Theopolis, before he passed away, said, You and I are the best architects in town. So, again, we're going to be late. Um, and then after Hurricane Ivan, we had quite a bit of dealing with downtown preservation activities that were going back fixing things that were muddled. You've all heard the term muddling, and you remuddle instead of remodel. Each of these churches had roofs on them that were new technology type roofs. It was an imitation slate. It was a, a tile roof that was not uh, <coughs> the, the clay original roof to tile. We were able to convince each of these churches to go back and use the original slate material in First United Methodist, the original uh, uh, the, uh, Celadon, Uchi Celadon clay tile, the First Baptist Church, uh, St. Michael's, back to a copper roof. We had to make it look old, so we had to come up with a pre patina method. In other words, you had to make it look great. It looked pretty bad for five, six years. The stout was starting to look decent, so I think it's aging gracefully. And St. Joseph's Church, it received the most dramatic amount of restoration, being that its roof was caved in. And we were able to use old photographs and old meeting minutes from the parish to describe what it looked like before. You know, Bishop Ricard, before he had to move to another position, he felt he adopted this church, found the money for us to restore it properly, and it was his favorite church before we left his home. 
And of course, Christ Church, if I remember our Christmas Day ceremony, when we rebuilt the tower that fell, remember the great photograph of the news journal with a cross fell in through the tower and it was in the, the sanctuary floor and then the, the nave on the floor. We were able to rebuild and reconstruct that. And again, I didn't use plastic parts. I wasn't going to allow them to build it out of concrete. We were going to use authentic terracotta. Eight months just to require it. Wes Con, uh, Wes Caldwell is a member of the church, and he kept saying, "I can do it cheaper. I can do it cheaper." But the idea was we wanted to do it right. So this was where we were pushing Pensacola level up a little higher. These are materials that we're comfortable using, so we might not use them. And so it was a glorious day when we set the tower back on, and Christ Church is now permanently with its bell tower. So old Christ Church and both new Christ Church. There's a very interesting project going on right now that many of you may have heard, some of you may not have. Uh, Voices of Pensacola Multicultural Center. How many of you have heard of that? Not many, not enough, okay. Well, this is a project that's a joint venture between, or a partnership between Gulf Power, in other words, we're using their money, and, and West Florida Historic Preservation Board, about to announce its new name in a few weeks. We're using their building, the Deacon Building, which is located just adjacent to the Bowden Building, just northeast of the T.T. Wentworth, at the yellow spot that you can't see on this map. Uh, but it's a project that was just adjacent to the old Opera House. Remember the Opera House that was should be located, a building, there's two law firms there, two little single-story buildings, just to the north of the Wentworth, that was the Opera House site. And in a hurricane in 1927, the whole back end was torn. But the Beacon Building is shown right there in this front. That's the Beacon Building. Two story. It's named the Beacon because how many of you, when you were teenagers, went there to hear music and dance? There was a city on the property. Gary was there. And many new bands started here. It was sort of a teenage hangout in the 60s. Is that right? 60s. Uh, it, was, it was originally the Cool and Grocery. It had been a place for tobacco, it had been a place for alcohol, it had been a place for warehousing with all sorts of our vices. So it makes sense for it to be a teenage high hanging out, I guess. And the building most recently, the city allowed Pensacola Historic Society to break place their archive. They did a renovation in 86 and they named it the Roman Science Building. So I'm just important to them. And this project will enhance the exterior and potentially change the way our museum and our, our district is entered. You know, right now, the old, the entrance to the museum is something we discuss. Where is the front door to the historic village? Where is it? Do you go through the Wentworth? Or do you go with the boots? These are questions that we are all analyzing. What is the best? And the thought is that if this building is taking on a new, this is how it looks from Government Street now, the thought is to remove all those sort of residential looking windows on the ground floor and open that all up to four storefronts so that it truly allows the inside to be seen. Glass storefronts, full height as possible. Our plan is to put new dormers on the existing slope roof so it's enhanced. We plan to light it. We plan to put exterior exhibits with a little triangular faces in the dormers. And we, we're planning to actually improve the south side now. That's the primary entrance off Church Street. If you're a historic researcher or if you're a student, you, you, you view this, use this building quite a bit. We want you to use it more. This, the, the Voices of Pensacola concept is about telling our story, telling our story using our own voices, not so much permanent exhibits, but in a way to describe all the diversity that has made up our culture, uh, from the Native Americans that were here prior to us, to the Spanish and British visitors. When we were doing in the lumber, this, in the, the snapper business, we were doing commerce all over the world. There was a time there was more international, international consulates in Pensacola than anywhere else in the Gulf Coast. We had these industry and stories to tell. Everyone in this room is a candidate for someone who would be invited to the Voices of Pensacola and possibly sit on the stage and chat with the audience and allow us to record it both vocally as well as visually. It will have a full media component. The front half of the building will be used as sort of a gathering space, the back half is an exhibit and multimedia facility that will allow demonstration and showing of videos once we've recorded these. But we already have an archive, quite a large collection of oral histories that have been on tapes. Those are being transferred and documented. 
uh, university students, as well as the group Alvare Design. They are helping us come up with a new technology on how to make museums relevant. How do we, how do we turn this idea of historic preservation into something that we talk about every day? You know, the, the new Navy Federal Navy, the Navy Bank building, you know, Maryland Hess's building that's going in on the corner under construction now on Halifax in Maine. We had a large conversation in the Architecture Review Board before we moved it about the appropriateness of that interpretation of our historic past. 20 years ago, it would have been a glass tower that was proposed completely inappropriate. Now we have matured as a, as a local cultural heritage group so that we are having a conversation of a much higher level. I believe we're able to push this bar further up. In Pensacola's level, let's increase that. We visited the Rosa Parks Museum in Montgomery. This is some examples of how the exhibit space and the research and archive space might then be uh, used in the, in the Poison Project. We intend to start construction. We had bids. The bids were a little too high. We all know that. We're now working on getting bringing them back in line without losing any of the function that we intended. We hope to be under construction within three or four weeks and hope to be open for business in 20. 14 around October, September, October is the goal. Now, a project that's ongoing that I'm, I'm a little less involved with, but it's the uh, Chuck Alvare, Alvare Design is doing, uh, thanks to a VP grant, the update of the T.T. Wentworth Florida State Museum's Five Flags exhibit. And he's, he sent me some of these this weekend that if you can see them, no one else has seen these shots. This is talking about his interpretive plan for the city of Five Flags exhibit. In other words, you all know the ground floor of the Wentworth is under construction right now. There's a big sign talking about it out front. In fact, we just tore up the sidewalk out front. We're going to pour that again so it'll be nice, nice and new with the new opening, which is scheduled for a couple of months from now. This is supposed to be open by the end of November. The deal with BP is you have to spend it quick or lose it. And so all the ground floor will be tied into a, a demonstration of our five flags, beginning with the wilderness, Water, Woods, and Wilderness. This exhibit will introduce all new technologies. It will be the largest screen, digital LED screen in Pensacola. You know, we have the Naval Air Museum. And Chuck's and his group is involved in many of those exhibits. So we're bringing some of those technologies, the things that work, the things that appeal the most to the visitors, because we can track that stuff. And we know what people like, what they don't like. And we're putting this in this museum. Uh, it's going to change dramatically the experience. And that's the key. The experience has to speak to each one of us on a level that, it, that we appreciate it. And then the problem with the museum is that it never changes. Well, this will have technology that's changing all the time. And both of these ideas is something that's interactive. Uh, we, we, we all worry about our kids having too many devices. Well, they grew up with those. Because they grew up with technology, they want to talk to people when they're in the educational mode. So my students are, I'm learning from the students that I'm now teaching that they really do cling to this one-on-one -on -one event. What we're doing here today is still very important. Internet uh, education is not going to take over. It's going to simply supplement. Uh, this is, we'll describe the British group. We'll describe the territory to statehood. We're talking about a new city in the new south. And we're actually lo looking toward having the past as a prologue for the future. And so the way that we are demonstrating this, none of this looks like what you've seen before, so this is new stuff, and it's a half a million dollar exhibit. I don't think that the curator has ever had a budget in the history of West Florida uh, this work preservation board to spend so much on a single exhibit. So this is really a big deal. These two projects, Voices, and what we're doing with the Five Flags is a big deal. It will be, I know, we're all invited to big openings, and please send, this is the, we're always looking for that hook we have the beach, that's a hook. We have a wonderful six main Palafox Street, that's a hook. How do we make this stuff even further? In other words, how do we make all of our streets in the top ten, right in the top ten? Well, that's just Palafox Street. So, again, my, my slides are a little too small, but I'll describe what I was my intention of this. We've been looking at a big picture of downtown Pensacola for quite a while. We've been trying to understand what's right and what's wrong about it. We're trying to identify those opportunities. And logically, most of the opportunities are in the undeveloped sites. And most of those undeveloped sites simply are paid for parking. So in, in many ways, those opportunities are 
pretty affordable once we realize that's the right thing to do. We have a master site plan that now shows the historic village from park to park. We've sort of been describing the composite urban end of Seville Square. This is the historic school village. It does include the Florida Public Archaeology Network, just south of Bayfront, and it does include the Barclay House, which is also beyond that. But what I did is a map, and it's hard to see here, but I'll describe for you that this is on the north, the top of the map is a photo of St. Augustine. <coughs> We are always in competition with St. Augustine. We're older than St. Augustine. We're better than St. Augustine. What we need to do is, is, is engage what's working in St. Augustine that receives about 12 million heritage tourists a year compared to our less than a million. What is it that's working? And I did a map here, and this sort of overlay, you see the, the orange thing, that is the historic footprint of the walled city of St. Augustine. On the right lower side is where the fort is, and on the west side is, is where the old custom training house. In the middle is the Constitution Plaza. This is overlaid the city of Pensacola, and I'll be glad to email this to anybody that has an interest later. I know it's hard to see. But the, it, the, the Maritime Park is on the bottom left corner, and the Barclay House is on the upper right corner. In other words, St. Augustine fits in between Maritime Park and the Barclay House. And the difference is for us is we have a lot of holes, we have some gaps, we have some unconnected pieces to that. All of us, how many have been to St. Augustine? Most people, yes, right. See, more of you have been to St. Augustine than knew about Voices of Pensacola. <laughs> that's, that's part of our problem when we recognize that. Um, but St. Augustine, when you're there and you leave your car in the spot, they have a thousand parking space garage in one spot related directly to the visitor center from which you can have five or six different modes of transportation, whether it's trolley or, or carriage or walking or a cab or a linked little train thing. Walking from there through that village, you never feel like you're walking very far. There's always something to do at each step. That is what, when you heard the term walkable cities, that's what that's about. When a city is such that you want to leave your car away, that's when you have a walkable city. My contention is that Pensacola, the scale of what we have to our major components, we just spent a lot of money on the Maritime Park, and it's, it's becoming a wonderful destination. Its distance from there, Jerry says he walks to the ball games. His, he lives just next to Barclay House. He's got the best front yard in America. And, and if we connect those, we will start having the same impact as St. Augustine without doing much else. You know, in other words, this is not a big money venture. These are baby steps that we can do because we've been doing them. The first 10 slides I showed you were those successful historic preservation projects that we completed. All of this was done because it was the right thing to do. It was the, it we restored in a capacity that was of the Pensacola level. And I'm suggesting that we need to raise the bar a bit. If you can see the slide on the right, I'm actually standing in Terradona Street my camera to the right is looking down Zaragoza, one of the most beautiful landscapes, historic sites in Pensacola that we could have done. Immediately turn to the left, and that's what we see. Large, a large paved area, the tracks that, it's okay to have a railroad tracks there, that's part of our history, but there are ways in which we can minimize the impact and make it more pedestrian friendly. It's done in other places, it doesn't have to be a weed filled center spot that you have to step over and dodge the glass. Those are simple things to fix. We are inundated with utility poles that if you were an abstract artist, maybe you would love them. But it's not the thing that is, is creating our front door. This is the first image you see. These, this, these two shots are our most important, one of our more important intersections right adjacent to the historic village. Everybody that visits, when we say come to Pensacola and see our heritage, they see this. We've done it. Bury utilities on other blocks. Powell Fox Street, they're all buried. They're in Aragon. Everything was buried before we started. And the good news is there's about 10 new homes about to start construction in Aragon. So we're slowly seeing things happen. You know, Pensacola falls last and rises last. And that's okay. That's one of the reasons we live here. But I think we count. We know that we're on the rise. The thought about the images of the historic village are that the entrance must be delicate. Remember, you got time to do it. I 
think if we can take these images and do something about them and insist that the city do the same thing. Now the slide on the right is our new library. We spent a lot of money on it, yet it's still got overhead power lines right at the front door. The slide on the left is the Sanger Theater edition. We spent a lot of money on it. Now they did bury the, the, the power there, but there's a gigantic transformer stuck right in the middle of the sidewalk that you cannot get around. And if you were in a wheelchair, you would not have accessibility. Jefferson Street is the largest width of, un, of paved street in downtown Pensacola. We have sidewalks painted on the asphalt. We can do better than that. We already, we already have. The thought is, let's come up with some very simple, standard methods. We've done it well. Jackson, uh, right in front of Jackson, is a wonderful example of how the landscape and the streetscape works. We've done some nice things in the village with using different paving for parking. We don't have to just park on asphalt. So that when we get to this kind of shot, we don't have to explain it, that we can allow our assets to speak for themselves. We have done well. I think we can continue to do well. And I'm here to, to do what I need to do. And if anybody needs an architect, uh, please hire me because business is slow. <laughs> <laughs> Body of work is extraordinary. We appreciate all your work here in Pensacola, historic Pensacola. This is you. Thank you very much. Come back to see you. Thank you all. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks for going. Uh, appreciate that. We're also going to be donating a book to a local school in your